Hello, welcome to the Hammer Museum. I'm Claudia Bester. I'm the Director of Public Programs here at the Hammer, and I'm very happy to introduce tonight's talk by Dan O'Shannon. Dan has been a serious student of how to be funny since he was a kid, and he was doing stand-up by the time he graduated from high school. He sold his first real sitcom script, one that he wrote on spec for the show It's a Living, when he was only 22 years old. Since then, he's been working as a writer and producer on many of the most acclaimed network comedies like Newhart, Cheers, and Frasier. Currently, he's an executive producer and writer of the show Modern Family on ABC. And I have to say that I am absolutely not a neutral bystander here. Uh, I am of the opinion that Modern Family is one of the most hilarious shows I have ever seen. It is dead on perfect. And I know I'm not the only one who thinks so. It's very popular in red and blue households. In fact, Michelle Obama and Ann Romney both said it was their favorite show. So I'm in good company. The show is currently in its fourth season, and it's received more nominations and awards than I could read here in an hour. Um, but suffice it to say that since its debut, it has consistently been recognized as one of the best comedies on television with the best writers and the best cast. This Sunday night will be the Golden Globe Award ceremony, and we're going to see if Modern Family will win again for best television series in the comedy category. I have no idea how writers come up with such hilarious renditions of contemporary family life, but they just completely nail it on this show. James Parker wrote in the Atlantic Magazine that Modern Family is a masterclass in pace and brevity, and I agree. And where does that come from? Of course, the actors are the most perfectly cast ensemble of talented and funny actors, but I don't think they would get anywhere without the amazing scripts written by the brilliant writers on the show. And needless to say, they work very, very hard at it. Through his experiences and study of the subject over the past 40 years or so, Dan O'Shannon has come up with an entirely new approach to comedy theory. It challenges long-held beliefs and shows how the three main theories of comedy actually work together as parts of a larger comprehensive model. Dan's work has earned him four Emmy Awards and 11 nominations, two Golden Globes, five Writers Guild Awards, an Annie Award for Best Short, a Peabody Award, an Academy Award nomination, and an honorary doctorate from Cleveland State University. And he teaches classes here at UCLA, at USC, and at Cleveland State as well. His new book, What Are You Laughing At?, is used to teach writing and comedy in universities throughout the United States. And we will have copies of the book, or we do have copies for the book, uh, for sale in the lobby. And I'm sure that after his talk, Dan will be happy to sign copies of that book for you. I know I'm going to get one, and I am definitely going to get one as a present for my dad, who will be super excited. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Dan O'Shannon. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? All right. Hey, I sound great. Um, uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for coming. Um, I'm Dan O'Shannon. Uh, I have a quick question before we start. First of all, you can all hear me all right, right? All right, good. Um, a quick question. I have a friend named Danny Zucker who is on Twitter, and he has about a billion followers, and uh, another friend, Megan Gans, who's also had many followers. And earlier this week, they both tweeted that I would be here, and I'm curious, are, is anyone here because of Danny's or Megan's tweets? Anyone? Raise your hand. Two. Three. I cannot wait to go to work tomorrow. <laughs> Fantastic. Um, all right, uh, here's what's going to happen. I'm going to talk about comedy theory for a while, and then uh, after I'm done with that, I'm going to give you a very, very broad overview of comedy theory and, and what it is. Um, and the book is uh, much more detailed, obviously. There are certain topics in here I'm going to gloss right over, but I could talk for like an hour on each one. And then be uh, questions and answers. And at that point, you can ask me about comedy theory, but if you want to talk about different TV shows or writing or anything like that, I'll open it up to that as well. But first, you have to eat your vegetables, which is to listen to comedy theory for a while. Um, all right, so comedy theory. I, uh, I was not born funny. Okay, I was not. Some kids are. Some kids are born funny. I hated them because they got lots of attention and everyone loved them. Uh, nobody loved me and I got no attention. And uh, when I was eight years old, I made the conscious decision that I was going to be funny and therefore people would love me and give me a lot of attention. And um, I uh, didn't have the slightest clue how to begin. I have a very analytical mind, but I was eight years old, and so the first thing I did was I started to imitate things I thought were funny. At the time, eight years old, 1969, uh, it was Jerry Lewis, so I walked around all the time, Blay! and I very quickly learned how to not be funny. And um, 
But a lot of trial and error, a lot of very lonely years, and a lot of studying and analysis, and I became kind of a comedy detective, is how I sort of frame it in the book. I became obsessed with what is it that people are laughing at? What makes them laugh? Is there a magic formula that you can create a joke that will always work, or something you can do that always works? What is it that makes people laugh? And it, it became this lifelong goal. To the, I still try to try and understand the laugh. That's it. The goal is to understand the laugh. It's the goal of the whole book. And it was not always easy. Uh, there was one laugh that took me 15 years to figure out. Hello. Oh, bye. <laughs> there was one laugh that took me 15 years to figure it out. Okay? It was a laugh that um, I saw on the Mary Tyler Moore show when I was 15. And uh, it was an episode where Mary Tyler Moore's character, Mary, goes out on a date with her boss, Lou Grant. And they have been friends for a number of seasons. And they decide in this one episode they're going to try and up the relationship a little, see what happens if they go on a date. And so it ends up in her apartment in this very awkward scene where the two of them are sitting on the couch and they go in for this very clumsy kiss. And at the moment they start to go in for the kiss, they, they sort of realize how silly it is that they're doing this, the folly of this action. And they both start to laugh at how silly it is. And that's when I heard the laugh that confused me just a little bit. It was the studio audience laugh on the soundtrack, this loud shriek of laughter followed by a sudden taper. It kind of just didn't sort of like keep going like a lot of rolling laughs do. It just kind of like died out sort of prematurely to my ear anyway. And it was something that stuck in the back of my head. I thought, well, that was kind of unsatisfying. Couldn't sort of figure out why, but I, it just stuck back there. Fifteen years later, I'm running Cheers, and I do a joke for Norm. And I have him in, in this one little bit, not a great joke, but he stands up and he says, you know what, you guys, this is the day I get off my ass and I get a job and I tell my wife I love her and I stop drinking beer. And, but he's just kidding, and of course Norm is, because he doesn't believe all these things and he can't get through it without making himself laugh. And so he laughs at his own little joke. And that's when I hear the studio audience at Cheers do this loud shriek of laughter and a sudden taper. And I looked at George Went, and I looked at the audience, and suddenly I understood the laugh that I'd heard 15 years earlier on the Mary Tyler Moore show. So when I'm done with this talk, I'm going to throw it out to you and see if you can see what accounts for a laugh like that. Because it's very odd to my ear. OK. We're going to uh, talk about comedy theory, as I keep saying. And a lot of theorists will hone in on the joke. They will dissect jokes from here to the moon in the back, and they, and they get no closer to understanding what comedy is. And I think what we have to do is pull out and really analyze the entirety of comedy, the comic event, the comedic event, is what I'm calling it. Because a joke on a piece of paper is not comedy any more than a dynamite is an ex than dynamite, stick of dynamite is an explosion. Okay, comedy is experiential, and you have to study the experience in order to understand comedy. So on the face of it, we have the comedic event, hopefully this works, like, which is very simple. We have a receiver uh, that could be you, me, anybody, and that receiver that the person who will experience the comedy will come into contact with some comedic information. We will use a triangle as a, as a sort of diagram here. Uh, now, this could be a formally structured joke. It could be something they see on the street that's funny, a dog chasing a flashlight beam, a baby making a face, anything that information comes in and gives them a comedic response. And they come into contact with, no, they don't. Okay, they come into contact with this information, and of course, they have a response, all right? So in this uh, case, uh, they come into contact with a linguistic joke. The doctor says to Mr. Jones, Mr. Jones, I'm afraid you're going to have to stop masturbating. Mr. Jones says, why? And the doctor says, so I can examine you. <laughs> All right? You've had your response, the response. And by the way, I heard a number of very different responses here. Some actual laughs, some kind of polite laughs, and ah, from somebody. <laughs> See, and that's comedy. So you're going to get these different responses from different people. But why? What's going on? So we're going to look at this experience. We are going to talk about comedic structure. We are going to go into that triangle. But we are going to look into, uh, we're going to zoom in on the entire process. Okay, we're going to look at these arrows in particular, because it's in these arrows that all these variables come into play that will determine the response to comedic uh, uh, information. And we're going to start with this column on the left. Because often, our response to comedy is already determined before we even hit the information. All right? So we go here, we have our receiver, and then there's the comedic information on the right, and we have elements of context. And I'll talk very briefly about them. A lot of them are very simple, very basic, and you'll say, well, duh, I know that. And then they'll get a little more complicated as we go on. So we'll start with our baseline re uh, reception factors. Who is the receiver? What are your predispositions? What are your likes and dislikes? How is your mood? How is your health? In good health, you may find something funny. In bad health, you may find exactly the same information unfunny. A little bit drunk, you might find something hysterically funny. You know, that, that's right, very sleepy, you might be punchy. Your physical uh, and, and emotional state will, will have a huge impact on your response to the joke long before the joke comes along. I'll give you an example, my wife was watching the movie Space Jam, and uh, it was during a critical time in her cycle. And uh, <laughs> at the end of the movie, uh, Michael Jordan made the final shot and she burst into tears. 
Okay, so, yeah, oh, oh, this is true, you know, but that's the thing. It's like, would she have another time? No, exact same material, but at a different time in her health, in her emotional well-being, a very different response. So that has to come into play. We under, have to understand that. Social context, we'll talk a little bit more about this later. Uh, our laugh may be different depending on whether the source of the comedy is in the room with us or not. We might have a polite laugh. We might have a laugh that encourages them to do more. If you're watching a, a film, the sitcom, for example, like uh, we did on Frasier, the audience was largely laughing because the stuff was funny, but also laughing to communicate with the cast. David I. Pierce, Kelsey Grammer, we love you. Often the laughter would slide into applause at their performance. Okay, so that enhances the laugh. They're also sharing this laughter with other people in the audience. If you're watching a sitcom at home, chances are you're not laughing as loud as the studio audience, but you're not communicating with the cast and you're not communicating with a vast audience of people who are thrilled to be in Hollywood. So they're having a very different experience than you are, even though you're all listening to exactly the same material. All right, vehicle, jokes are often encased in a larger narrative context, a man-made context, a novel, a play, a TV show, what have you. Your feelings for those vehicles will impact your response to the jokes within. We have jokes that would be thrown out of a writer's room on a sitcom for not being good enough, that will get laughter and applause on a Broadway stage. And it's because people feel very differently about Broadway productions than they do about the disposable free sitcom. And so they will react very differently to the identical material in each. So again, uh, this keeps going back to, and I keep harping on this, you have to understand the experience the audience is happening, not just the actual joke. Feelings about the source, this is extremely important and extremely basic and simple. If someone you love tells you a joke, you're gonna laugh differently than if someone you hate tells you the exact same joke. That's very simple. But I, I, I met George Burns once. I was a huge fan of George Burns all my life and I got to meet him once, it was the big thrill of my life. And I knock on his office door and I'm scared to death and sure enough he opens it, he's got the cigar and everything, <laughs> Mr. Burns. And uh, he says, so what do you do? And I say, I'm a, I'm a writer. And he says, so write something. And I fall on the floor, it's the funniest thing I've ever heard. You know, I walk away five minutes later, I go, that wasn't funny. Well, no, it wasn't terribly funny, but I loved George Burns. He took him like 95 years to get me to laugh that hard. I had a whole history. My feelings for him dictated my response to that joke. All right, so that is, uh, uh, and of course, the ever popular, etc. cetera. Um, there's a lot more, but you know, you get the gist. So all of this, again, this is, this, any of these factors may be determining your laugh before you even come into contact with the material that we call a joke or something that you're gonna laugh at. All right, so now let's talk a little bit about comedic structure and then we'll get to some variables after that, all right? Uh, comedic information. Uh, comedy, oh, this is gonna be tricky. Comedy um, has two core variables that often you know, come into play. Uh, the first one is we're gonna talk about is incongruity, all right? Now we have a receiver, as I said, could be anybody, and we have a setup. Now, in a formal joke, we have a setup. Two guys walk into a bar, you know, I shot an elephant in my pajamas, whatever the setup is gonna be. Often, humor does not rely on a stated setup. Not everything you laugh at every day is going to be preceded by two guys walking into a bar or how many this does of that. And yet, we still laugh. And that's, but there is a setup. And the setup may be simply our understanding of how the world works. We know the world usually works this way, and then we witness something that is totally askew. And we understand the incongruity and we laugh. Now, there was not a formal setup presented. The setup was triggered by this odd thing that we've seen. Okay, so now we have a source. The main job of the source is to provide new information. This is going to be essentially the punchline, we'll call it that. Now, this, this source could be a comedian. It could be someone you're talking to at dinner. It could be a dog or a cat doing something silly. It could be nature. It could be yourself if you happen to think of something that makes you laugh. But that source is gonna provide a punchline. It's gonna be information that we are gonna connect with our knowledge that is in the setup, whatever inferred rules we have from the setup. The receiver will connect these two ideas and having done that, will come up with some level of incongruity. It could be very low incongruity, it could be the kind of character comedy like, you know, my girlfriend and I do this, and then you go, hey, my girlfriend and I do this, the stuff you see every day. Then we get to higher incongruity, your mama's so fat when, they, when she wears white, they show movies on her, ha ha ha. You know, that sort of thing, where okay, so this woman's as big as, a, okay, that's impossible. Um, that sort of thing. So each joke will give you a different level of incongruity. Now, our recognition of incongruity re leads to a visceral response. I wanna talk a little bit about incongruity. I could talk all night simply about incongruity. It's so important and so uh, multi-leveled. But incongruity is this thing that triggers a visceral, visceral reaction in us. We are hardwired to recognize incongruity. Okay, why? And why does it make us laugh? Well, 
We spend the first years of our lives building this rule book in our minds of how the world works, how gravity works, what cars look like, how food tastes, how people act. And we are constantly defining the world around us. And then we get to a certain age and we have those definitions in place. And the rest of our lives is spent uh, uh, comparing what we see to what we know. Oh, this falls into this category. This person's like this person. That is this kind of car. We know that rule book. All right. But we are hardwired to understand something incongruous, something that is different from everything else, grabs our attention right away. Why should it? Well, because in an evolutionary sense, that's what probably kept us alive. All right, something out of the norm could be dangerous, and we had to notice that it was out of the norm very quickly. Let's say that we are those proto pre-language beings, okay? And something out of the ordinary comes: a twig snaps at the wrong time at night. Something makes a noise we're not familiar with. A shadow crosses a wall that we don't know what that is. What happens to us as these proto pre-language human beings? Our hackles rise, our pulses pound, we sweat, we're scared to death because whatever it is could kill us and eat us, okay? And then it turns out to be, oh, someone, you know, uh, snap the twig. It's my own shadow. It's just a rock falling. It's safe. And suddenly we are awash in this relief, this physiological release uh, of chemicals that we associate, this wonderful drug rush that we associate with, we are safe. We, have, we are going to live another day. Ha ha, take that forest, we win. It's superiority. It's, it's all these feelings that come up, and it's the most wonderful feeling. And we look at each other, we've all experienced the same thing because we were all like this and ready to fight and it was safe. And we all look at each other and we go, ha ha, ha ha, ha ha. Okay, such, such from that I think is the birth of laughter and the birth of comedy. And how is that comedy today? Because so much of our comedy depends on some kernel of incongruity. That today, safe incongruity, I'll talk about why it has to be safe in a moment, but some safe uh, recognition of incongruity in the most absurdist jokes in whatever makes us laugh during the day, whatever, that, that flips these trace swi uh, switches in our psyches. Just click on and off, we recognize it. We have that, that, that species laugh that we've given to it that, that is triggered by that feeling. Now, I talk about safe incongruity. That's the incongruity we know is safe. And, and it's very interesting, because uh, to this day, like if you're startled in a horror movie, it's not uncommon to see everyone jump and then kind of look at whoever they're with and kind of laugh. There's a laugh that's associated with that kind of like, all the triggers on, all the triggers off. The switches on, switches off. Um, there are times when you will see somebody actually reflexively make dangerous information safe and then laugh at it. You, you've probably heard of or perhaps seen uh, an instance where somebody is told that someone is dead or some horrible information, the most serious thing you've ever heard and shocking, and the person will just sort of get blank for a moment and then laugh. I don't know if you've ever experienced that, somebody laughing terrifically inappropriately at some shocking news. That happens. And what it is, is the brain hears this information and it is so threatened by it, it's so dangerous, that it refuses it. It refuses the validity of the information. This cannot be true. It cannot make sense. Therefore, what is it? I'm stuck with this information. It must be nonsense. It is nonsense. Therefore, I will laugh at it. The brain will make the information safe and then allow you to laugh at it. Uh, alternatively, sometimes we try to make things that are threatening um, safe by making jokes about them. You're walking through a cemetery, you might make jokes about you know, the dead bodies and the ghosts and whatever to make things okay. So, so safe incongruity is extremely important. All right, so that's incongruity. The other core component to uh, comedic information, uh, I think I said that. Blah, blah, blah. Oh, what if I'm holding this upside down? There you go. And I did that, vehicle. What's the next one? Etc. Okay. La la la. They'll cut this out of the tape. Uh, okay, source. He does what? He supplies the setup. Uh huh. Levels of incongruity. Read a book. Okay, we get to find something to do. Redo a visceral response. Cognitive uh, process. I earlier said that the receiver takes the new idea and it connects it to the old idea and recognizes incongruity. Okay, but that is not something that is just simply uh, A plus B equals C. Sometimes it takes different levels of cognitive process. Sometimes jokes are like puzzles that have to be solved. So each uh, kind of material has a different level of work you have to put into it in order to assemble the incongruous picture. Okay. Um, by the way, that's, that's another thing about jokes is that formally constructed jokes are often like puzzles that you have to solve. And then the reward is a little bit of incongruity. And once you piece that together, you think incongruity, uh, switches flip on and off, you get to laugh. Um, as I said, once you've connected those two ideas, you get incongruity, but sometimes it doesn't take that much work. Someone tells you about something that happened during their day, you see a guy fall down the stairs, whatever it is, you don't have to do any decoding, that's a low level of, uh, of cognitive process. Then you have jokes where you have to do a little bit of algebra, you know, jokes where you have to listen to the, pun uh, the setup, and then you have to go back and fill in a gap, and that gap allows you to have the, uh, the punchline. 
Uh, you might have something, recontextualization is the highest one of all. That's where you have a setup, and then the punchline makes you go back and understand the setup in a new way. I gave a joke on uh, a Modern Family recently. Uh, Luke was teaching Manny how to play uh, baseball and, um, and says, uh, can you choke up? And Manny says, I probably will when they play the national anthem. Okay? <laughs> so what does that make you do? Well, you hear the setup. Can you choke up? That's fine. He says when they play the national anthem. You now hear that. It doesn't make sense with what you've just heard. So logically, you have to go back to the setup, choke up. Oh, there's a different kind of choke up that makes that make sense. You've solved the logic. Now that you've solved the logic, you get the incongruity of Manny thinking that that's what could have been meant. And you get the little emotional picture of the kid crying at the national anthem, which is always fun. OK. <laughs> Now, our recognition of structure can lead to an appreciative response, which expresses itself coincidentally and confusingly in laughter, which leads me to the dichotomy of comedy, because there are two types of laughter that we engage in and we see every single day. There's the first, the visceral response I told you about. The recognition of incongruity will trigger this in us. Okay, but then, again, go back to us as primitive, pre-language human beings. We did something with laughter that I think is brilliant. Okay, we took that sound. That, that, that represented that feeling of triumph, of happiness, that goodness, that thing, that sharing element that I talked about. And we repurposed that, sh that sound as communication, basically to say, I am friendly. We are having a nice time. I am not threatened by you, nor am I threatening. This is fun. We are having fun. And it isn't I am laughing at something funny. It is I am communicating. It is like our tail wag. It is a literal emoticon, an LOL. Okay? You may see it all the time or experience it yourselves. Challenge yourselves to listen to how you communicate to your friends, friends, especially friends you haven't seen in a long time. You get together on the street and you talk. Listen to the laughter in the conversation. Because there isn't laughter coming from jokes, but there's laughter all over the place. You got a haircut? Yeah, I got a haircut the other day. <laughs> you're laughing. What? What? <laughs> you're laughing because you're wagging your tails. That's the, that, is, that is the second kind of laughter. And it is also huge in comedy, because that's part of the reason we're laughing at people who are standing up doing comedy. We're laughing at what they're saying, but we're laughing to communicate with them. We're having a good time. Keep going. This is great. Okay. Now, uh, these laugh, as I say, so you, you have this kind of entertainment, and you have both kind of laughters working in concert. Now, it's hard to gauge which of the laughter is dominant in an exchange. I was at a dinner party uh, some time ago, a very smart guy, and toward the end of the evening, he told a joke about something that happened while he was traveling. And he got a nice laugh from his guests. And a few weeks later, he and I were talking about comedy theory. And I said, you know, you told this story, and you got a really nice laugh. What, what, what do you think accounts for the laugh? And he started talking about the structure. You know, he's not talking about the event, he's talking about the joke. He's talking about the structure and how you set up this frame of reference and blah, blah, blah. And he's probably got something to it, probably right. Here's what he's not taking into account. He's the host of the party. He holds the social power. Everyone's been drinking. He told the joke well. It was late in the evening. He's standing in front of the front door, and they're holding their coats. OK? His laugh looked like this. It was a huge behavioral emoticon followed by some actual laughter at the material. Now, the thing is, an average theorist would look at this and start dissecting the joke to see what accounted for that laugh, and then determine that those people had a specific kind of sense of humor because of that joke. They're not looking at the experience. All right, so that is, uh, that is uh, comedic structure. Now, you would think as comedy writers that what we would do is we would have, all of our jokes would have high incongruity and high levels of cognitive process to get high laughs. You would think that's what we would do all the time. And if we did that, you see, the thing about comedy is it's so freaking flexible. And I must, I must get this point across, because this is the most important thing about comedy. You cannot boil all comedy is X, all comedy is incongruity, all comedy is this, all comedy is that. Comedy has to be flexible in order to survive. And there have to be all these different checks and balances and things working in concert. Otherwise, comedy would have lasted about 10 years in our culture. Or actually, what would happen is probably kids would find things funny like tic-tac-toe, and by the time they're about 10 or 11, nothing would be funny anymore because we would all see the easy patterns underneath. There has to be huge flexibility built in. And this is one of the things I'm going to show you that shows that. Let's say that you have a joke with low cognitive process, low incongruity. You would think, logically, that it would get a low response. But that's not true because we have this other set of variables that's going to come in, enhancers and inhibitors. Because the content or structure of some of these jokes are going to trigger an array of feelings inside each person that listens to them that could add rocket fuel to the response. You know, Schopenhauer was talking about this one time, not to me, and he said that, um, he said that, <laughs> it sounded like he did. Uh, he was talking about incongruity, he said, people laugh at incongruity, and the more incongruous a pairing, the louder the laugh. Well, he wasn't thinking in terms of enhancers and inhibitors, because what happens is you can have something that's low incongruity, but it's triggering all kinds of other feelings in you, like identification. The less incongruous something is, the more common it is. The more common it is, the more we relate to it. And the more we relate to it, 
the more we will laugh. So let's say that you go and see uh, Kathy Griffin or Ray Romano in concert, these are Bill Cosby. People who don't tell these big structured jokes, but they talk about their lives in these long kind of rambling monologues. And they don't have crazy structures and they don't have absurdist punchlines. They're just talking about their lives. Okay, so their jokes are shaped like the ones on the left. Low cognitive process, they're easy to get. There's not, there's not a bunch of word puzzles there. And, and low incongruity. So why, why the response that they get? Well, let's say that you are listening to Kathy Griffin and she's talking about a self-deprecating thing that happened to her. You may feel superiority toward her or Brooke Shields or whoever she's talking about, and those feelings are gonna trigger more of your laugh. Uh, let's say that you have identification, you're listening to Ray Romano talk about his family, Bill Cosby, that sort of thing. Uh, in any of the material, you may hear uh, things that trigger aggression, relief, shock, disgust, joy, et cetera. You may have an appreciation for the performance. You watch Bill Cosby go through a thing where he talks about his family and he becomes each member of his family and you are loving this guy and you're loving his performance. From before the material, you have feelings about the source and your social context, you're with an audience, it's all live. Suddenly this joke that has low incongruity and low cognitive process has you with a reaction that is through the roof. Okay, so that's an, a way that comedy is flexible. Now, any enhancer can also be an inhibitor for someone else. So someone could love the Three Stooges because the violence gives them a, a sense of the safe aggression and they can enjoy it and laugh. Other people look at the aggression and that exact same enhancer for the first person will be an inhibitor. It'll push them away and say, this is, not, this is not my cup of tea, it's not funny. They're looking at the exact same information, but their enhancer is an inhibitor for another person. All right, I'll give you one more set of variables and then we're kind of done here, actually. Um, because, uh, as I said, comedy is experiential. We have to understand the experience. But we experience the joke on many levels. We actually experience them in different aspects of awareness. For example, earlier I told you the joke about uh, the doctor and Mr. Jones. Now in that reality, there is a doctor in a waiting room and Mr. Jones. There is not me, there is not a theater, there is not all of you. That is our reality, but we're aware of both. Okay, so we have the joke's internal reality. And by the way, any of these aspects of awareness can trigger its own array of feelings. We have the joke as a joke, where I tell a joke and you're aware that I'm telling a joke and you're monitoring my performance. You're comparing it to jokes you've heard before. You are judging it and assigning a number of, eh, I'll give that a nine out of 10, whatever. But you're aware of the joke of the joke simultaneously. And my performance is going to trigger some feelings. It may be a joke you've heard before and the familiarity becomes a, an inhibitor. So it's not funny anymore. All right, well, there's also a huge section on comedy and entropy, which I unfortunately don't have time to get into tonight. Uh, jokes impact on its context. This is kind of fun. Um, some years ago, uh, Stephen Colbert spoke at the White House Press Correspondents Dinner. Remember that? And he ragged on George Bush. And his jokes, I thought, were pretty great. And, you know, everyone has their own opinion. I thought the jokes were great. But if you were going to go by the, audience, uh, the audience's response, you would think these jokes are not very funny. <laughs> but they were muted. Why? Because they were all aware that five feet away from Stephen Colbert was George W. Bush. Okay, and so they were very uncomfortable and they're afraid to laugh. So their laughter, again, had nothing to do with the joke, but their awareness of the joke's impact on its context. Now, I'm watching the thing on my computer and I'm laughing like crazy because George Bush isn't in my room. So I'm having a very different experience. I'm experiencing the same material, but I'm having a very different comedic experience and therefore a different response than the people in that room. Now, two years later, Obama was speaking at the same dinner and he made a bunch of jokes about Donald Trump who was in the room. And he had some okay jokes, but they were hugely enhanced by superiority and aggression because no one was afraid of, of offending Donald Trump. <laughs> okay. We also, by the way, it's interesting that, that um, we, uh, let me, uh, receivers relation to other receivers' responses. Okay. While you're in an audience, while you're with other people, you're aware that you're all receiving comedy and their response is going to impact you. Let's say there is somebody who a split second before you're about to really laugh at a joke goes, oh, well, that's gonna dampen your response. I've seen that happen at table readings, it's hilarious. Uh, well, actually it's not. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but you are aware, sometimes we do jokes in a show that we know that 10% of the audience is going to get. And we'll put them in, and what happens is those 10% will laugh much harder than they would at a joke they know everyone's getting because they're aware that other people are not getting the joke. It puts them in an exclusive club. It gives, club. It gives them inclusion with the source and it makes them superior to other audience members. So this knowledge, their, their relation to other viewers' responses is triggering its own feelings, independent of other aspects of the joke. I'm not too uh, proud to admit that there have been a couple times in my life where someone's told a clever joke and I start to laugh and I hear myself starting to laugh just before someone else and I laugh a little bit louder to let them know I got it first. <laughs> I'm a jerk. Um, now, this is, this is so ingrained in us that the other viewers do not, the other receivers do not have to be in the room for us for this to be a viable aspect of awareness. 
Okay, we might be with a group of very intimate friends, and one of those friends might tell a joke that's completely racist, but you know the guy, and you know this other person, and you all kind of laugh at it, you know, okay, we know this isn't how you play, but we're laughing at the absurdity of the joke, whatever, or the subversiveness, the shock value, whatever is triggering the laugh, we're laughing. But if you see the same thing on TV, you're sitting alone at home, you see the same thing on TV, you might not laugh, and it might not because, be because you don't think the joke is funny. It might be because you are aware that this is going out to millions of homes, and to some of these homes, this joke is inappropriate that there might be kids watching, that it might be offensive to some people. So their responses are affecting you sitting alone in your living room. You might read a book and see something in a book that would make you laugh if told in this little group, but because you know it's out in public, you have a disapproval of that, and that's going to affect your laugh. So you see, all these things are going on all the time, and it gives us as writers all these ways to manipulate and provoke laughter that is not simply writing the same jokes over and over and over and over again, even though it looks like that on a lot of shows. Okay. So as a quick example, we've got Lucy Ricardo up here. Um, she has been trying to bake, I think, bread. And uh, she's done something terribly wrong because the, the bread has grown, or was it a cake? I don't remember. I didn't see it. Uh, but it's grown about eight feet and pinned her to the uh, cabinet. Nothing phallic there. And um, <laughs> I, like, I particularly like that the tray has also grown eight feet. I don't know how that happens. Um, <laughs> So, okay, so just some of the aspects that could come into play, some of the enhancers, uh, we have from the joke's internal reality. Oh, by the way, this takes a low amount of cognitive process to understand this, and it nets us a high degree of incongruity. From within the joke's reality, we are relating to Lucy Ricardo, or we feel re a superior to uh, Lucy Ricardo, we may feel joy at the absurdity of it, any of these feelings for any different viewers, who knows. Uh, from our awareness of the joke as a joke, we might have appreciation of the performance of Lucille Ball, who is a different person in our minds than Lucy Ricardo. Uh, there might also be a lot of inhibitors. You're sitting watching the show with someone else who's seen it a million times and laughs like a crazy man every time Lucy does anything, and suddenly you're laughing less because you hate this person. Okay? <laughs> so enhancers and inhibitors all over the place. So, so all of this is a huge and very, very uh, basic overview of how comedy works. And so just the next time you're like laughing at something, listening to people laugh in a restaurant or whatever, and you, especially your own laughter, ask yourself, what am I thinking? What am I trying to say? with this laughter, because there's a language to it. And if you listen enough, you'll start to hear things you've never heard before. Uh, that's essentially the talk. I want to quickly go back to the Mary Tyler Moore laugh. So remember, anyone remember that? I want to try to account for a loud shriek of laughter followed by a sudden taper. Okay, very quickly, Lou and Mary are on a date. They go in for a kiss. They start to laugh. Studio audience, shriek of laughter, sudden taper. Any guesses? Any takers? Any takers, any guesses? I'll just go ahead and tell you. Yes, sir. Okay, the uh, suggestion is they're laughing at the, at the awkwardness, and then what happens is uh, when they, uh, it ends in disappointment, they associate with the disappointment in their own lives, and that makes them sad, I suppose, as opposed to happy. That's very possible that that is an element of it. But um, I will, again, go to the understand the experience. I, it sounded like an odd laugh to me because it's not a laugh I would have in my living room watching the show. The studio audience thinks they're seeing a blooper in both cases. Norm starts to say something, he starts to laugh in the middle. Mary and Lou start to go in for a kiss, they start to laugh in the middle. The studio audience thinks they're seeing the actors make a mistake. They start to shriek with laughter, oh my god, the, the, the actors are screwing up, but the scene keeps going and they have to shut up and get back in the scene. Now I am watching the exact same material on my TV at home, but I'm not having the same experience. I'm watching a fully edited, finished broadcast TV show. They are watching a play being filmed. So they have a whole different set of rules and expectations. They understood it was possible to see a blooper. I knew it was impossible to see a blooper. My laugh would never have been that. It took me years to figure that out. So anyway, that is the comedic experience. <laughs> and uh, so hopefully, uh, I think we can close these because I think we're kind of done here. Um, but anyway, so let's open it up and we can talk about questions and answers and comedy and TV shows and anything that anyone wants to talk about. And I think people are going to run around with microphones. Is that correct? No? I, yeah, I yeah. can run around with this we one. We have the microphone. OK, right. I think someone over here has a question. If you want to start over here. Thanks for listening to this, by the way. It's just it's grueling to talk about. I can't even imagine what you went through. No, 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 no. No, no. You had your chance. <laughs> you speak about, or they introduced the three theories of, of comedy, but uh -huh. I, and you speak about the experience right. of comedy. Right. And someone that hasn't studied comedy, I don't know what those three theories are. You know, I, are. I, I wasn't aware that was going to be in the introduction, uh, so I, having heard it, I should have actually gone through that. There's actually probably three or four, and then, then many more sort of sub-theories. But there are theories like uh, all comedy is incongruity. Like I said, Schopenhauer says, we all laugh at incongruity, and the more this, the more we laugh. Freud said that, uh, that all uh, comedy is relief. 
that there's a buildup of tension perhaps either stated in the joke or the comedic experience or a social tension that is then washed away by a joke where the joke breaks the ice or the punchline breaks the tension. And by the way, all these, as I've said, and as you've seen up here, are sort of parts of comedy. Uh, like when I mentioned meeting George Burns, and I laughed at him because I love George Burns. I had feelings for the source that I was gonna laugh no matter what he said. He could have said, I'm having a stroke, and I would, that's the funniest thing I ever heard. It could have happened. But also the fact that he made a joke brought relief because I was nervous about meeting him and he put me at my ease. So you have to, if you're like mapping out the experience, that's a factor that would have to go in. Does that account for the whole laugh? No, but it's part of it. Does it account for all comedy? No. There's also superiority as a big theory in comedy that you always feel superior to the person who's dumb or the target of the joke if there is one. Um, uh, aggression, that safe aggression is released through comedy, subversion, shock, all of these things that are, are, are held forth as comedy theories. There are structural based theories, one called incongruity resolution, which don't even bother, it's a big waste of time. Um, and so, so the, the problem with comedy theory is that I think the way it's been approached is everyone's looked for that magic bullet that all comedy is X. And then you, so they come up with this and you go to the theorist and say, well, therefore, is all X comedy? And they said, well, no, there have to be certain circumstances. And then you go, okay, now what is it? And then the, the theories get more and more complicated and further and further from any kind of truth that you can look at and see in your own life. Um, so it's, a, it's, a, it's kind of like that story of the blind people, the blind people and the elephant. Each one is going to say what an elephant is like. And one feels the side and says an elephant is a wall. And one feels the, tel the tail and says an elephant is a rope. And the tusks, the elephants are pointy. It's like that with comedy theory. I think people take a certain amount of jokes and they dissect them and try to extrapolate all of comedy. When the fact is jokes are the tiniest portion of what makes us laugh. They're the easiest to analyze, and so we want to say that comedy, all comedy is that. But again, there's all this social aspect. There's the stuff that makes you laugh when a baby does something cute, and you're looking for the, what's the actual joke in there? Well, there's no joke joke in there, but we're still laughing, we're still feeling. There's so much going on, and jokes are a tiny part, and you cannot reverse engineer all of comedy out of one joke. Okay. Oh, you're very welcome. Um, any, uh, pick anyone, I'll tell you what, uh, people with microphone pick people. How about that? Uh, you you began uh, with a discussion that you wanted, you didn't feel that you were funny or, or comedic when you were young, and right. you wanted to become, and you worked at it. Right. I've always, well, I, I have sort of believed that there are some people I know who just have absolutely no sense of humor, and I'm wondering if you think that there are people uh, who can be, who can learn, uh, people I've known for decades that just, um, yeah, yeah, no, which, I, uh, which makes one think we call them executives. that there has to be some, <laughs> wait, I, what did he say? We call them executives is what I said. Oh. Um, no, I, I, I understand what you're saying. Um, and that's a good question. I honestly don't know. I, I, I know that, uh, that I've been lucky and analytical and I dedicated hours and hours of my young life instead of actually <laughs> going out with girls um, <laughs> or having fun of any kind, uh, watching cartoons and TV and trying to figure it all out. Um, and a part of me would like to say, well, I just worked harder than other people who want it, but I'm sure there are people who want it desperately and they just never latch on to a way of being that gets laughs from people. Uh, maybe it's like music where some people can do it and some can't. I, I, um, I'm beginning to think that, that you know, some people simply don't think that way in a way that's conducive uh, for them to elicit laughs from other people. And it might be something in their personality or just something in their thinking. I, I don't know. I, I, but I, I, I guess I'll say that I don't think everybody can just sort of be made funny because they want to be. I, I've only recently come to that. I think when I was younger, I thought if anyone worked hard enough, they could do it. But only as I'm older and I've read a thousand spec scripts do I think not everyone can do it. <laughs> no, I really was. I was that naive. When I was in my 20s, I was such an idiot. I was in my 20s and I thought, I thought, well, why are there poor people? Why don't they just all write TV shows? You know, I, I was such an, I said, no, and that's truly, I, I don't mean to be mean. It's just like, well, why doesn't everyone do this? Well, because not everyone can. And I look at my scripts from back then. I go, I was lucky I wasn't homeless. But, uh, um, but no, it's, it's true. It's, uh, unfortunately, there, there is a bit of a knack to it, it's maybe, or a predisposition to it. It's like people who teach themselves to play the piano or this or that. It's like, it's in there somewhere, but, you know, some people were just born doing it instinctively without trying. I, I think I had to sort of figure it out, if that answers anything. I doubt it. You all hate me because of that thing I thought when I was in my 20s. Um, someone with a mic has to come down. There's some people in the front row, and there's somebody right there. And Here comes someone with a mic. Make this good. <laughs> Hi, uh, Hi. I want to talk about uh, laughter as, as being a medicine. Yes. Um, I talk with uh, a lady uh, who recovered from cancer here at UCLA, mm -hmm. and she said Arsenio Hall really helped her recover. 
Well, he's also um, a doctor. And I was going to ask you, uh, since you, you have your doctorate, you know, um, <laughs> can, you, can you talk about uh, the innovation uh, well, that's going the, on? Uh, well, I, you know, I honestly don't know what's happening in the field that people are studying, but I will give you an anecdotal story that's true. We had a uh, writer's assistant on Cheers, uh, a very nice guy. We had him for years, and he's still around. And uh, until recently, he was a writer's assistant on a lot of, like, top comedies. And he contracted the HIV virus in 1982. And, he is and this is well before they had the, the cocktail that could kind of keep people stable for a long time the way they do now. But, uh, but he, you know, alive and kicking and seemingly in good health, but he's had this virus forever. But his job, certainly since 1982 on when Cheers started, was to be in a room full of people every day and laugh his head off from morning until night, which is what he did. He is the most good-humored, gentle soul I know, I've ever known. And he's still kicking around. And he's doing great. And... You know, the only thing we can think of is he laughs all day. And maybe that is, I don't know how, what the percentage is of how that affects him, but it seems not ridiculous to conclude that might have been part of it. But unfortunately, as, as, except for that one anecdotal thing, I know that, you know, me and uh, the, the, the people I work with, we laugh all day. And I, I think it feels good even when we're all terrifically anxious and depressed and everything. It's nice to know that we laugh a lot. And maybe that's keeping us alive. So I'm, I'm sorry that's all I've got on that. Uh, oh, we go. go ahead. Hi there. Hi. Uh, hi. Quick question about breaking in. This is a question I've asked a million times, and I'm sure you've been asked it a million times. And not one person has answered you. <laughs> no, they, they, they I'm going to be the guy. To, they, they, they just walk away. So they do. All right. Um, no, this is going to be different, I swear. <laughs> for aspiring baby riders. <laughs> See, I told you. <laughs> it's the same reaction. I can't help it. Yes, sir. Um, how do you get past the, gatekeep how do you get past the uh, gatekeepers, other than riding nonstop? Um, try to network. Do you have any other advice? Uh, this is tricky. I, I broke in in 1984 uh, when it was it was a very different time. And um, for one thing, we didn't have internet. You know, it was very different. I uh, I had to learn how to make a, do a spec script by buying one that had been produced in Hollywood and then bringing it to my apartment. And I had to study this thing back and forth. I borrowed a manual typewriter on which the space key did not always work. And so after every word, I had to manually advance the carriage and do my first spec. I had to hold pages of the script to the window and then take my typing paper and mark where the margins were so I go tap, 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 character name, tap, 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 tap dialogue. So to this day, when I see someone who has computer programs and, and they can do everything they want and they hand me badly formatted scripts, I get so angry. Um, that's just about me. That doesn't help you. Um, <laughs> Do you know what? I, I think it sounds as though you're actually doing everything right, and you simply have to keep doing those things. The networking is actually very important. This is a thing that I was not particularly good at when I started, but I was very lucky that I met some people early on who took an interest in my writing, and they taught me uh, you know, how to keep making it better. And um, I, I wish I had a good answer, but I will say, I, I, ha, ha, I can direct you to something. Uh, there's a writer named Ken Levine that I worked with on Cheers and uh, Frasier, and he worked on MASH, and he does Simpsons, and he directs TV shows and that sort of thing. And he does a blog called By Ken Levine, B-Y, Ken Levine, L-E-V-I-N-E. -E. And it's a daily blog. And he's been doing it for six years. And he talks about TV writing. He talks about his other interests too, but largely it's TV writing. And he's answered every question you could possibly answer, uh, ask. Uh, he's answered them in depth that I could not even approach here. So I would suggest uh, very seriously look up By Ken Levine and go through his archives because everything you can ask about starting, what kind of spec scripts to write, who do you show them to, how do you get a partner, anything that you can ask, he has answered better than I possibly could at the moment. That's At least I could, you know, I didn't walk away, but I had to shuffle you to someone else, sorry. Uh, okay, uh, it's up to the mic guys, so I'm just letting them, yes. You probably know that one of the best writers on Sense of Humor is Sigmund Freud. He wrote jokes at its connection with the unconscious. Yes. where he talks about double entendre, pants, etc. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. And uh, I use one of his jokes because he says when he uh, something is very serious, uh, sorry, very serious, the opposite is very funny. So when asked, I say, um, I'm a man with a great future behind me. Oh, um, nice. Also, there is another writer, sorry, just few, Henry Bergson wrote, uh, a French philosopher wrote Le Rire in French, which is laughter in England, and um, he also talks about uh, various things. Also, he, uh, Bergson, uh, <laughs> and what, what, what books are found in the library? No. But Bergson hey, says, you've been to the library? OK, this is going to be a while. All right. uh, but uh, Bergson says that in a world of pure intelligentsia, in yeah, a few yeah. thousand years, there will be no more uh, sorrow, but there will be no more jokes. But jokes are well, a we'll sort of 
a sort of uh, satire of people. Finally, uh, I want to say that in Italian, laughter is riso, r s o r i o, and you have an English word, the risability. Uh, and also, finally, to complement all these books, uh, we have uh, your great book. And that's it. <laughs> I apologize for, uh, if I was being rude, but I, I, no, I, I did listen to everything you were saying. And uh, I think there's a lot of interesting literature about comedy out there. Some of it is really hard to read. Some of it's very inaccessible and really not funny. You know, you, you start to think that the people who are writing it have no ear for it at all. But there is a lot of great stuff about it and very thought-provoking. And thank you for sharing that. And uh, I'm sorry if I was rude there at all. I just had nothing to add, so I didn't. Hi there. Hello. Um, <laughs> I remember growing up in the 70s that my family, we all used to gather around the TV oh, and we'd watch days. the various sitcoms. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that kind of destroyed the mood was my mom pointing out how everybody used canned laughter in the sitcoms. Oh. So I always grew up with an assumption that most of these shows are using canned laughter and not live audiences. What are your thoughts about its use and is it really that prevalent? Uh, okay. Um, it's still in existence, but not nearly like it was. I think that uh, you know, back in the 50s and right up through the 60s, there was a lot of canned laughter being used. Um, but then a lot of live audiences shows simply have loud audiences. And why do they have loud audiences? Because they have warm-up guys throwing cocaine at them during the break <laughs> and playing games with them. And then they watch the scenes. And of course, as I said, they're excited about seeing the, laugh the, the actors. And they shriek at every joke. And every time someone goes in for the kiss, they go, woo! and then they laugh because they're laughing at this guy and then they see a take where they do a different joke and they laugh even harder. None of that is happening in your living room. And so you watch the recording of this and you hear those people laughing and of course you go, there must be canned laughter because it isn't this funny. And the material itself might not be that funny but the experience, again, is very different from what they're, they're experiencing. And sometimes this can be really annoying. I, don't hate me, I can't watch David Letterman because of this. Uh, I think his jokes are like a certain amount of funny and then he'll tell a joke that's about this funny and the laugh goes from here to about there and then back and then Paul does something on the drums and everyone laughs harder and then he does something, oh, that's Conan, no, same thing. But, uh, but the joke, it's like this big joke, 10 hours of audience shrieking, uh, this big joke, 10 hours of audience shrieking. Uh, and to me, it's like, I, it's, it's kind of a lie to me. It's like I, I'm, I'm watching this, but I'm watching a, a thing a happening, but I'm not watching a guy performing. Um, if, uh, an interesting thing to see is the episode of Ellen, uh, the, the, the sitcom, uh, the episode where she came out. It's called the puppy episode. And it's a good episode. It's well written. It's funny. But it's hard to watch for me because of the laugh track. And it isn't canned laughter. It is the studio audience laughter. But episodes have been building up to this big thing. And there was a lot of tension. Is this the one where she's going to come out? And there were a lot of people in the audience to whom this was a huge cause. And so every joke that was this big, they got huge laughs because it was this kind of success of, yes, this character is going to come out and speak to those of us who feel like we've been shut up. And it became a rally instead of a TV episode. So there is a sitcom there, and there are jokes there, but it's cheering and stomping and parading every time a joke happens. So to me, that makes it hard to watch because I don't feel there's a, a, a certain amount of uh, honesty between the, the actual comedy and, that I'm experiencing and the audience that I'm hearing if that makes any sense to you. Uh, but but there are, uh, mostly the stuff that's live is, is live. It might be sweetened, there might be a technical problem, you might need a joke to, to bridge a, a, an awkward transition, stuff like that, but largely it's real as far as I know. Uh, it's up to, it's, it's Hi, up to that hello. guy. Hi, hello. Over here. Uh, do you actually consciously think about comic theory when you write or when you uh, work in a writer's room? No, no, I actually don't. Uh, I think that would kind of wreck it for me. It's almost like I, I sort of deconstruct it afterwards if I want to. Um, I think I, I sort of, uh, I write sort of instinctively. I think when you write, uh, to me you have to be three entities. I'll talk about writing for a moment. Um, I know I've been talking about theory, but I'm also happy to talk about writing or, or just, you know, that kind of thing, writing comedy. Um, but I tend to be three entities while I'm writing. I'm myself, the person who is writing all these things and has to structure a scene and get this thing done by a certain number of pages and that sort of thing. I'm also the characters. You know, the characters who do not know that what I'm writing is funny. The characters who believe in what they're doing and do not know that they're making an invisible audience laugh. I have to believe in what they believe in. I have to find myself in them. I'm also them. And I am also the audience who's watching at home and does not know what's coming and is watching a TV show and has to have a certain amount of information at each step of the way unless I decide to withhold it or whatever. And I have to juggle all of these in my head and sort of be them. And it's more of an instinctive kind of visceral process for me than going, okay, so I've got a setup and I've got a punchline. And what, I, you know, it, you just, after doing it for years and years and years and years, I've done it for 
28 years, 29, something like that, and seeing thousands of studio audiences, you, you sort of just can instinctively know that you're hitting something in a joke that's going to make them laugh and, and sometimes make them cheer and, and, and that sort of thing. But it's a, like I say, it's more a visceral process. I, I don't sort of deconstruct before I'm writing it. I think that would lead me to madness. I think it would. Hello, how you doing? I, I, I can't, it's the guy who brings the mic. It's, I'll tell you, later I'm gonna give you my mic. I'm sorry we're busy. No, um, go ahead. Not at all. Um, I've noticed, first of all, I'm a sociologist, and I feel that sociologists and comedians have this instinctive view on the world where they'll find certain things hilarious. But uh, my question is, uh, have any authors growing up, or either contemporary speaking, um, have any of them provided an ample amount of comedic uh, material for you. I, I've always thought that Kurt Vonnegut was a hilarious author, even though he was a science fiction author by trade. Right. right. But he was just very dry and very observant about a lot of things that I found hilarious. What about yourself? Um, I, I, there's certainly authors, uh, artists, uh, comedians uh, who have influenced me growing up. And I had kind of a wide range of, of likes. I, I discovered a writer named Robert Benchley when I was growing up. He'd written back in the 30, 20s, 30s, and 40s, James Thurber, that sort of thing. But I also liked silly stuff. So I liked Mad Magazine. I liked cartoons on TV. I liked a lot of everything. Um, you know, your question, you know, do I... I do find a lot of things hilarious, and I try to make a lot of things hilarious. Does that necessarily mean that, that all my inspiration is hilarious? Because a lot of stuff that I'll draw from is terrifically serious. And someone once asked me in a class, you know, I want to be a comedy writer. Should I remember all the funny things me and my friends do? I said, no. Remember everything you and your friends do. Because chances are very good the things you find hilarious now, in 10 years you'll roll your eyes. And the things that make you want to kill yourself now are going to be hilarious to you. <laughs> and that's true. Everything is fuel for a writer. Everything that happens is fuel for a writer. So I, may, I might see like a movie or read a book where a structural kind of thing sticks out at me, and I go, wow, how would that be in a sitcom? Or I'll see something like in a sci-fi movie. I, I actually I did an episode of Frasier where I had an idea structurally that had come from my happening across an episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, which I wasn't even like really watching, but I happened to see this one episode. And I thought, I bet we could do something like that on a Frasier. And I went and I moved it over to there, and it, it worked out really well. But um, you know, you just never know where anything's going to come from. So I don't necessarily seek out that which is hilarious or that which is funny. I just sort of keep one eye open all the time. I hope, anyway. Uh, you, you know, oh, th yes, thank you. Yes. Why, why do you think um, I don't? <laughs> no. Okay. <laughs> no. No. God. Yeah. Miss Fry. Miss. Then let me rephrase the question. No. Why are things like physical comedy, like uh, Lucille Ball or Peter Sellers as Clouseau or Chaplin? Mm -hmm. You know the whole setup. It's physical comedy, though, so there's a special thing going on. Mm -hmm. Why is that repeatedly funny? Because you can watch Lucy do this thing with the chocolates yeah. 30 over times and, over and, over and, and you over. still laugh. Why yeah, yeah. is that? Well, um, particularly if we're watching something in a movie or a TV show, it isn't just like a joke that I tell you over and over. I just told you a joke over and over. It would get very old. Okay. But if you're watching something in a scene, there's a million places you can go for your enjoyment. And what I mean is, let's say that you're watching Chaplin eating a, a, a shoe as though it's a Thanksgiving dinner, or you're watching you know, Clouseau falling down. And what you, you laugh at, at, the, at the actual idea of this. You might be laughing because someone who is kind of snooty does something that makes him fall down, and you laugh at the superiority of that. But you also might laugh at the artfulness of it, the fact that it is so sudden, or that he just does it perfectly. And you're laughing at appreciation. So you've got that aspect of awareness where you're laughing at appreciation with Clouseau. Uh, there's also something very primal about physical comedy because it doesn't rely on us decoding information or putting jokes together logically. We connect with the, the information on a more personal, visceral level. Okay? And so that might be something that just speaks to us intuitively. It's also the kind of thing, back in the days of silent movies, you know, they could basically show a movie we made here all over the world. They didn't have to worry about translations and what did this word mean and what did that word mean. And it was so unifying and so absolutely human. There's something I think that connects us with that. We can relate to somebody who is just doing things a little more than we can relate to whatever's being said. Okay. As far as uh, things getting less and less funny, things eventually uh, do get less funny for people. Uh, and it's an interesting thing. 
what you will start, you will watch people start to do. When I was growing up, uh, there were UHF stations on TV that needed programming, and so they loaded all their programming, it seems like, with the Three Stooges. And I wasn't even a fan of the Three Stooges, but it was on every hour of every day when I was growing up. And I knew kids that just could memorize these things. They could say them back to front. And I would watch them with people who had watched them a million times before. And they would say, oh, watch, 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 what, watch what Curly does, watch what Curly does. And then after a few months, we're, watch what Mo does. And they're starting to look at different things in the scene. If you watch a scene with someone who's seen it a million times, they'll start to say, look what that guy in the back does. Look what that extra does. And what they're doing is they're trying to keep alive their love affair with this scene that has given them so much fun. They've sort of exhausted the primary incongruity, and they start to look, oh, look at Larry's face when he does this. And they start to explore the scene and look places that weren't supposed to be the focus when they first shot it. It's very interesting watching, watching entropy happen. Um, but anyway, that's kind of the best I can do on that for now. Hey, Dan, front row. Uh, oh, hey, hi. Hey, hey um, so I have a stand-up background, and recently I was watching a George Carlin stand-up from, like, the 70s. And the reaction of the audience to those jokes, because at the time they were so shocking mm -hmm. and radical, it's unlike reactions I've ever seen ever in my stand-up career and watching any present-day stand-up. So I guess my question is, like, the ante for shock keeps getting higher mm -hmm. and higher. Like, is that going to crash, or can that keep being built upon? And how does that affect sort of the shock value of comedy? Well, I, I, I find it a little disheartening myself. I think, like, back in, when George Carlin was first breaking a bunch of taboos, there were other people doing it, too. He was just a little more mainstream. He had, like, Red Fox and a bunch of people, these party records they used to play, uh, Moms, Mabley, whatever. And people would, like, get together at these basement parties, and they'd play them on their record player, and they'd be shocked because people were saying these horrible things. But we were coming out of, like, the 50s, and we were coming out of World War II, and we were coming out of, like, this era when everything was white bread and above board. And to, to hear this, like, shocking stuff was so amazing. It was like this release you know, so part of the laughter of that audience is released. We're finally saying in public, in a public forum, these things that we're not allowed to say. And it's funny and it's naughty. And again, it's this kind of social release. And you can only have like a big release like that kind of once. And then it's kind of like, all right, well, now we've said it and we've said it again. And we've said it again. I'll say this other thing. It's a little dirtier, a little more risque. Ah, more release. Ha ha ha. A little more shocking and more shocking. And it becomes, I think, uh, to me, it, it, it gets less shocking and less fun each go round. I, I think we've pushed the envelope. It's like I don't even know what can't be said on TV anymore, and I, I sort of don't care because that stuff doesn't interest me. I, I'd rather watch characters doing things. Um, I think that might be part of the success of Modern Family is that, that it doesn't really push a lot of envelopes that way. It goes back to the basic roots of how people act and you know that sort of thing. I mean, we have a lot of goofy wordplay and stuff, but I mean, it, it isn't trying to push any envelopes. I, I think it's a little bit of a dead end just trying to shock people into laughter all the time because we're running out of things to shock people with. You know, and so so it's like, yeah, I mean, it's only natural that would play itself out where it actually ends or if there will be a, yet another wall behind that to crash through. I, I can't say. I just don't know. But you know, it's interesting. I, I look at the same thing. I wonder. Hi. Hello. Uh, first question. Will you read my modern family spec? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, but my actual question. That's a good question. No, what? Um, <laughs> Let's go to two. Uh, when when you're writing mine. a first draft, yes. are you more concerned with hitting your story beats or and then punching up the jokes, or hitting the jokes and then uh, have the story catch up? And when you're in a writer's room, are you guys first pitching story and then jokes, or? Okay, um, I uh, I myself I tend to to. Jokes uh, come and go. I mean, you, you, you can always replace a joke with another joke. Ten other, ten other jokes will come along. Jokes are great, but story is first, I think. Um, and character is in there. That's something you're not mentioning. But character, to me, is, is, is actually, to me, even a little more important than story. You can have a little bit sloppy story as long as you have amazing character. Uh, when I first started writing, it was all about the jokes. And I wrote some funny scripts, and I got—I did okay. I was up to the point where I was on Cheers, and my scripts, I think, were pretty funny. And at the time in my life, I was very unhappy, not like now. And uh, I thought, <laughs> I thought, I thought I should—I uh, should maybe see a therapist. But I was afraid that if I saw a therapist, the therapist might iron out all the quirks in me that actually made me funny, and I'd be less funny. I really did. I thought, well, I'm funny because I'm, you know, a nut. But uh, so I, I went into the therapist, and 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 the more I learned. I, it actually didn't make me less funny. It just it actually made me a better writer because I started to learn the patterns I repeated in my life, things I did, things that I thought was just very surface. There was stuff underneath going on that was very different from what I was displaying to the world. I started to learn about subtext from myself, and I started to see it in other people, and I started to feel it in characters. And I started to think that Norm and Cliff aren't just like these goofy guys, that they have these internal lives that they just want to be liked. Um, 
And so I started writing jokes that gave me little pieces of them. I wrote one for a cliff, I remember, where someone asks what a Freudian slip is, and he says, that's when you say one thing, but you're thinking about a mother, okay? <laughs> um, and it tells me a little something about him, you know? Um, and it's also around that time I went from writing, my favorite character up until then had been Cliff to write for, because he said all these silly things. And he was this really nice guy, and all he wanted to do was just be everyone's friend and you know, know it all, and he had a little bit of ego thing. But then, once I'd been in therapy, I started really loving to write Frazier, because he was so much more complex, because he looked down on these people at this bar, and he didn't want to be there, but he desperately wanted to be there, and he desperately needed them, and he desperately needed not to show how desperate he was, and suddenly there were all these levels to his writing that I could sort of sink my teeth into. So to me, finding those little things in the characters are, are so much more important than everything. I mean, the story, absolutely, you need to nail that story. Character and story are the two big things. Jokes will come from that. And if you have a page that's kind of dry, go back and get a joke later. But make sure you're true to the character and you're bringing us along on the journey, the, the viewer. Uh, but that's, that's kind of how I approach it. Everyone else is wrong. Okay. Hi there. Uh, I don't even know where you are. I'm oh, there, hi, hi, hi. Hi, how are you? Fine, uh, you. <laughs> thank you so much. Not at all, uh, I've done nothing. Trying to formulate this into a question, but the observation that I had was that when I first watched Modern Family, I thought, this is clever because it's really three or four sitcoms and this could last for 12 years. Did you yeah. think of that when, when, did they think of that when you put, the, put it together? Because sometimes you see a pilot and you go, oh, this will be funny for about two years. And well, the guys who created it, Chris Lloyd and Steve Levitan, um, I think they might have thought along those lines. I, I think they, they didn't want to just make it too, so simple that the one idea would wear itself out, that you'd be bored of one set of five characters in a living room. Um, I will say that one of those things, the, the, fact, the very fact that it has like 10 primary characters and we do at least three stories a week makes it exhausting. It makes me, it makes it, if it is gonna last 12 years, it's going to kill us all because it's a, <laughs> because it's like, it's like you say, it's a bunch of sitcoms in one. So every week we are not just writing one episode, we're writing three episodes, they're a little shorter and then we're having to figure out how they go together and then how do we not repeat ourselves? We repeat ourselves. And we, uh, we have to keep like doing these every week and it's, it is actually a huge challenge to us as writers and to the actors to find new nuances in them, and hopefully we're, we're finding them, and I, I know there are times that we, I feel we've tread a few th scenes before, but that's natural in any show. Um, but uh, I think there is, um, it's tricky, you know, the show doesn't have like a built-in romantic thing in it where it's like will they or won't they, you know, unless, you know, maybe Luke and Alex could get together, it's kind of, um, but no, I mean, there's no, there's, I mean, everyone's married, and they're happy, or they're kids, you know, and you're not really invested in Haley and Dylan, like, oh, will they get together, you know. Um, so there's not that kind of engine driving it. So, so it, um, it's a very difficult show to keep going, but I think if we can sort of keep mining our own lives and a lot of hopefully creative what-ifs, we can still get a few years out of this, I hope. I hope. I hope I formulated that into an answer. I don't think I did. <laughs> Anyone, anything? Oh. Okay, I think I'm next. Okay. Okay. So um, you talked about... Uh, those inappropriate jokes where uh -huh. it's funny if you know the person, you know, if it's a racist joke yeah, or sure. something, yeah. but when it's, you know, sometimes it's more serious. Um, so I'm wondering how you would use comedy to address social justice issues, if you would at all, um, and any recommendations, it's kind of a few questions, any recommendations that you would have besides, you know, the Ellen where it's, you know, this... Um, rally, as you called it, um, and then if you have, if anybody comes to mind that does a good job of doing that. Well, I will say, um, and I'm not taking credit for this. I'm really going to credit uh, Chris and Steve, who created and run Modern Family. But I think they did a good job with Mitch and Cam introducing them to America, because you know there was a while toward the end of the first season there was a movement on the internet. Why haven't we seen these characters kiss? You know, a lot of very kind of you know, people who really wanted us to get out there and, and push these characters in America's faces. And I think that our, our point of view was to write them as a loving couple first and as gay characters second. And I think that made them palatable to audiences that would not have accepted them had we just shoved them full on gay, look at this couple kissing like episode one. You know, I think America had to understand and love them as people before they could become somewhat comfortable with the things that made them different. You know, introduce the stuff that brings them together and then introduce the stuff that makes them different. And I, I think that got them in a lot of doorways they wouldn't have otherwise gotten into. You know, um, uh, I think that's, that's kind of a good approach and, and something that I, I, think, I, think, I think the trick is to be thoughtful. 
about it and not be so blinded by your agenda that, that you have to just go and get your agenda out and, and basically, I don't care if people don't like it, this has to be said. Well, if those people don't like it, they're not going to hear it if that's how you're going to approach it. You know, you have to find the stuff that unifies us all. You know, someone asked me once why I thought Modern Family was such a success. And I, I think that it, if you look at what was on TV when Modern Family started, so much of our comedy was built on exploiting our differences. You know, I mean, I love Daily Show and Stephen Colbert and, 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 you know, Saturday Night Live and that sort of thing. But so much of it is they hate us. They're idiots. They don't believe in God. They do believe in God. They want to take our guns. They're idiots. Blah, blah, blah. And making jokes about it and laughing. And a lot of the laugh had a lot of anger to it and fear, but a lot of divisiveness. That side is stupid. People are different from us and we don't like them or they want to kill us before we kill them. Blah, blah, blah. And then we had a show where it was about, you know, showing what we had uh, in common. You know, that no matter what side you're on, what, no matter what religion you're on, we all have goofy families. You know, our family members, those are the enemies, uh, not, not each other. Um, so by actually celebrating the things we had in common and not exploiting the things that were different about us, we were able to kind of hopefully hit some unique chord that I think America was thirsty for. I think we were in like the civil cold war uh, for like years. And I think we've just been locked in this thing so long we're used to it. And I think it's still going on, you know. But, uh, but I think more and more comedy that, that comes along and, and is, is not about just alerting it to us to how much those people are idiots or how much, you know, they're jerks. I, I think it's all to the good, you know. I think we'll have causes, and I think we'll have social injustice, and I think we'll address it with comedy, sometimes with very barbed comedy that's supposed to anger you. Like some comics say, comedy is supposed to provoke, it's supposed to make you think. Well, the problem is sometimes if it provokes, it stops you from thinking, you know. Um, and so I, I think it's a bit of a limited thing. I think it's, it's got an audience, it's got a place. There's a, a comedy is so broad and people are so multifaceted that every kind of comedy has its place. I don't think there's one best way, but that would be my philosophy. Be a little thoughtful about how to put it out there and respect the people that you are talking to and not just try to turn them overnight into what you think, but to show them why it is you feel that way. Uh, you know, that's what I think. Oh, very kind. I'm wondering where you position irony in your structure. Is it part of incongruity, or is it a blend of okay, like common cynicism, uh, cynicism? Where do you position irony? Oh, well, there's two kinds of irony in comedy. One is, um, for example, ironic laughter. Like, we laugh at something that was supposed to be funny, but we know it's so not funny that it becomes funny again, so we laugh, but it's actually ironic because we're laughing for the wrong reasons it was intended. So that's ironic comedy. And then we have irony, like, uh, I'll give you an example of irony in my, in my life. Um, uh, when I was first starting therapy, uh, I went. To, I didn't have a lot of money. Even though I was starting at Cheers, I had some money. But I, I went to this place where they had an intake session. I'd never been there before, and I had to fill out this thing. And they asked me, do you want a male therapist or a female therapist? And I said, I'd like a female therapist, because if I had a male therapist, it would feel like I'm talking to my dad, and I have kind of issues there. So they gave me a woman named Terry, which is my dad's name. <laughs> okay. So that's irony with, that's just irony, okay? So the recognition of irony will, is like an enhancer in that way. So like I say, in, in that kind of, uh, uh, of context, uh, the recognition of irony in a story that you've heard, uh, and some people might hear a story and not actually detect irony, but irony can be an enhancer. It enhances your enjoyment of the story you've just heard. Okay, ironic laughter, as I say, is laughing at something that is so bad that it's good, and that's a different kind of irony. So that's, it's, it's, there's more about it in the book, I think. I should read it. It's very good. <laughs> Stop it. All right. Uh, I've talked to a number of actors who have worked with lots of different writers uh, on me. comedy, but uh, I kind of want to get the other side of it. All right. Because as an actor, um, oh. I'm just wondering, do you have any suggestions for actors on how better to work with writers in terms of that, that relationship uh. that you have? Um, you know, there's an old joke uh, about how you get an actor to complain, uh, give him work. Um, I'm kidding about that, actually. It's sort of true, but it's not really always true. It's not true. Um, um, but uh, how to better work with writers is to, I, I think, uh, like, it's almost uh, the same thing. Maybe this is a bigger philosophy than how to deal with, like, issues, you know, like, like a, you know, controversial issues on TV. It's like, 
you're working to create something with a writer. And if you, it depends on your position. If you've been hired to play a character that these writers have written and they know what the character is, then you talk to them or the director and say, you know, what is it you need me to do? How can I best do that? And you do it and you bring some of yourself to it. It's, it's when you get to a point where you're saying, I'm not doing that or this is stupid or you're commenting on the jokes and go, this sucks, you know, whatever. And we've, I've, had, I've worked with actors who are in great shows and they're great actors, but sometimes during the table reading, if one joke doesn't work, they're like, wah, wah. And I have to say, I get really upset. And I, I want, here's what I want to say, because I'm never really going to say it, but I'm going to say it to you guys, okay? <laughs> I'd like to go up to this one particular actor I know and say, dude, one joke, I'd like to stop the table and say, sorry, one joke didn't work for this writer, this guy who works two days a week while we come in and bust our asses for five days a week so he can work two days a week, get millions of dollars more than I'll ever see in the world, can give a fuck what he thinks about. Yeah. But I don't have the nerve. <laughs> 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 don't be that guy <laughs> because then I will tell a room full of strangers what I think of you <laughs> I'll show you <laughs> um, no I think it's just uh, you know just always understand mistakes get made you know sometimes things don't measure up to what you want you know whatever you're, you're working together to try and create something and there by the way I say this as though some actors are jerks, some actors are nice. This is true of writers, and it's true of directors, and it's true of executives. You know, there is no one group that's to blame for bad products. Sometimes writers, all those executives, they don't know what they're talking about. There are also bad writers. You know, bad executives, good executives, bad writers, good executives. Same with actors. You know, and the, the actors that are, are the most kind of like uh, uh, willing to work with other people, team-oriented, those are the ones that I, I think do the best. You know, the ones that, that aren't just trying to keep the spotlight on themselves, but know that they're working this thing where it's, you're doing this balancing act with other actors and trying to be alive in this moment that came out of these pages, you know, from these people. It's a, it's a very hard job to do, acting. And I, I have to say that, as much as I'm joking about it, I, I cannot do it. And I'm amazed by people who can. I'm amazed by our cast, because they take these two-dimensional words and, and they're alive all of a sudden. And I'm always astonished by them. I never tell them that. Uh, <laughs> because, uh, you know. <laughs> They really do not need to know. Uh, first of all, like they care what I think. Um, but uh, you know, be nice, work hard. That's really it. But that's true in every profession, I think, because I'm just a boy from Ohio. Um, yeah, that's louder than I was expecting. Um, how much would you say that the path of the show, I guess, obviously, it's case basis but is dictated by what the audience expects to happen. And I know you said it's not really such the case with Modern Family that two people are going to get together, but in mm -hmm. other shows. And the second part of my question would be, how much does um, executive pressure, corporate pressure, um, to expand the demographic, would you put, say, a joke that you didn't particularly find that funny or a story twist that you didn't find that amusing into the storyline in order to try and expand your demographic? Um, that's a tricky question. I, I, everyone has a slightly different philosophy about that, so I don't think there's one hard and fast rule about it. I tend to, I'm answering the second part first because I didn't understand the first, but then I'm gonna totally fake my way through the first <laughs> after I address the second. And in, uh, to answer the second, I really don't know what you're talking about. So the first, <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Um, I tend to, uh, you know, to me, it's like the bottom line is the best show or the best episode. Uh, and, you know, if an executive is saying, we want more of this, we want more of that, a lot of times their hidden note is we make, want to make sure we don't offend anyone because we care about the size of our audience or this might bring this kind of viewer in or that sort of thing. They're the ones who have this agenda. I myself, as a writer, don't have that agenda. It's kind of like, you know, as I say, as I write these things, I'm partially the audience, and so I'm trying to please that audience a little bit, whatever audience I have in my head except for my parents, they're in my head, and I cannot please them. Um, <laughs> but, uh, um, so, uh, you know, there, but there are some showrunners who think about that, and it's kind of like, oh, you know, if we have a younger person, you know, we'll bring a younger person on the show, that'll get a younger demographic. Sometimes I, I hate the thinking of that, because you had a show like The Golden Girls that lasted for years, and they didn't have to bring a little wise-cracking kid on. I did a show once, uh, uh, I'm not gonna bother you with what it was or what it was about, but there was a, a woman in it, here's what it was about. No, it was a, there was a, a, a woman character in it and she was going through therapy and her therapist was a woman and there was all this stuff going on in her life. And the note from the network was ABC at the time, was years ago. They said, make it a male therapist so that men will watch the show too. And it's this kind of viewers as dogs theory. Like, like I, I always imagine the guy at home like walking by his TV and seeing the show now with the male therapist and going, oh, it's a guy. I'm a guy. 
You know? That's all it could be. What, I, it's ridiculous. You know, so I, I, I tend to, it's like, again, to me, it's like the Golden Girls. It's like, and yet every uh, generation, people seem to forget the lessons we've learned, and we have to learn them all over again, if we ever do. Um, the first party question was what? <laughs> and I'm sorry for everyone else's new questions. No, not a problem. I spoke too long. Um, my question was, well, let's remember it. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, there we go. Um, how much audience expectation dictates oh. where you're going with the um, show? Uh, only in that if we're writing a show where the ending seems obvious and we say, well, people are going to see that coming a million miles away, so let's try to do something that surprises them. That, that's about as far as I think of it anyway. You know, I, I, as far as, you know, big arc things, I don't, I try not to think about that anymore. <laughs> I'm old. Um, all right, I know there were some other hands. Um, Hi, thanks for doing this. Oh, thanks for coming, really. Thanks for having us. Um, <laughs> just back and forth. Sorry, hey, I wrote it down. Do you have a long drive home? This is terrible. Wilshire was horrible <laughs> coming here, wasn't it? Who drove on Wilshire? Oh, my God. Wasn't it terrible? Okay, go ahead. See, now I forgot what I was going to go uh, to. That's okay. Um, my question was, um, some people's theory on comedy, comedy is that characters in a comedy show don't change because we come back every week to see them make the same mistakes over and over again. I would like to hear your um, ideology on that. Uh, this is interesting. I, I've worked on a lot of long-running shows. And long-running shows, sitcoms, two things can happen. One is that the characters start to learn and start to grow. It's this evolution of characters. And they will often outgrow the quirks that made them initially funny. Uh, for example, if you watch M.A.S.H., uh, the characters at the end of the series were vastly different from the characters at the beginning. I mean, they were nice and they were good-humored and that sort of thing, but a lot of their jokes were wordplay because they weren't womanizing drunks anymore. You know, they changed, they grew, they learned, and they learned so many lessons that the actors couldn't conscionably go back to a time before they learned the lessons. Even Frasier, that was happening toward the end. It was harder and harder to get Niles and Frasier in a frivolous fight because they'd had so many fights and made up so many times, it didn't feel real to the actors to go back to these frivolous fights anymore. And so you find ways around that. We would introduce other characters for Frasier to fight with, or we would try to find new things for Niles, but by the end he had Daphne. You know, Maris wasn't a problem anymore. He was loosening up. Again, all the quirks were going away. So. It's very tricky to sort of keep finding the humor in that. The other thing that some run, long-running shows will do is they will ignore evolution, and the characters simply will not grow. And so you have a lot of long-running shows where they're funny for a few years, and then toward the end, I, I hope no one worked on the show. Uh, to me, a little bit Family Ties became that. Uh, family Ties, which I, I loved for the first couple of years, and then toward the end, it was kind of like another shopping joke from Mallory, another Republican joke from Alex, you know. Um, and, and it was just like again, again, again. But it's tricky to do a long-running series. I mean, you are stuck because, uh, you know, America falls in love with something. And just like anyone in a relationship, it's if that person changes, it's kind of like, oh, you resent that person for changing. But if that person stays the same, you resent that person for staying the same. And it's very hard. I was running Frasier in the 10th season. I had critics saying, uh, critics, it's just not as fresh as it used to be. I was like, it's season 10. <laughs> hey, if it was just as fresh, there'd be something wrong with you. Um, <laughs> But it's tricky, so you have to sort of acknowledge that this is the case and hopefully keep finding those avenues of depth that still make it funny in different ways. You know, I had a very tricky choice to make. Well, I took over Frasier in season eight, and it was just after Niles and Daphne had gotten together. And the show was well entrenched in America's living rooms, and there were a lot of episodes that took place, like a kind of big stage, and a lot of farce episodes, door slamming and this and that, and they were hilarious. A lot of people mistaking people who were straight for people who were gay, and on and on and on. And Niles and Daphne, now that engine was gone. And I had a really tricky choice to make as the guy who was running the show. Was I going to keep doing the show just the way it had been, as though I was now the custodian of this thing and it had to work the same way? Or was I going to try to find some new avenues of storytelling, something that could bring something fresh? And I chose the second way. And I did some episodes that were a little trickier uh, structurally. I did some things that were more filmic. I, I, I did an episode where Frasier and Niles, there were some flashbacks to earlier episodes with Niles and Daphne, but instead of just doing flashbacks, I digitally inserted Frasier and Niles into these scenes that had been shot 10 years earlier and had them interact with themselves. Some really tricky stuff that the regime before me would never have done, but I needed to do it to, to sort of keep it fresh, but still keep, it, keep the roots. And the reaction I could have totally predicted. Some people embraced it, and some people said, what have you done to my Frasier? You've changed it. But if I had kept it the same, people would have said, oh, this again. So that's the problem with long-running sitcom. Entertainment, it's a very unique kind of idea, the idea of a long-running sitcom that you see these same characters week after week after week after week. And it's, it's very hard to maintain. But, um, you know, pitfalls everywhere. I, mean, I hope I answered any of that. I have a question about humor across cultures. I've noticed sometimes 
a French director who's really funny in France, and then they try and direct an American movie, and it just isn't funny. Or shows like Chapulín is hilarious in Spanish, but I don't think it would really work in English. What's that all about? Have you analyzed? Uh, well, no, but it, it makes sense because, as I, as I said, a lot of the times the sort of setup for that which is funny is our rule book, our understanding of how the world works. Okay, uh, We know how the world works, and so if something different than that comes around, we could recognize the incongruity. We can laugh at it. To many people in the world, the idea of eating chocolate covers ants is like an incongruity. But for people who grew up doing it, it's the most natural thing in the world. So in China, in France, and places that are different, they have a different cultural rule book in their heads to work from, to draw from, to find funny. In some very repressed cultures, it's more of a relief to make fun of the government or something because like, it's so wrong than it is here where we have a more free kind of way of behaving. So it's all about the rule books that people grow up with that determines what their sex sense of humor is. It doesn't determine what their sex is, which is what I almost said. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be my, my thinking on that. Oh, I have a question okay. about uh, up here on the back. Way back here, yeah. Um, I had a teacher in film school. We were talking about horror films where he said that there was a fine line between horror and comedy, that sometimes something could be horrific, then if it went too far, it would spill over into laughter. So mm -hmm. if somebody gets shot in the head, that's horrific. But if all of a sudden 100 bullets hit him in the head at once, then people might start laughing about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. So I was just wondering how you <coughs> well, sure, comment funny. on that. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I mean, <laughs> um, it is. It's just like in Congress, like one bullet pretty much does the trick, I think. Um, uh, but, you know, it's like, it's like, you know, what you're expecting. You're well aware that you're seeing a movie, and if something is, and I, I don't mean to do wordplay, but if something is overkill, if something is done way too much, you be it begins to draw attention to itself, as opposed to the narrative you're watching, you start to watch what they're doing over and over, and you'll find that funny, as opposed to, you will, you will flip, you will fall out of the, the, the narrative and you'll start to look at what is being done rather than, than being inside of it. If that makes any sense, it's a little hard to explain. I write about that in Comedy and Entropy and, and that sort of thing. It's, it's hard to get into. But okay, We're just looking at a couple more, is that the? Yeah, I think okay. we've got time for two more two questions. More? Right, great. Oh wait, somebody down here has been like oh, okay. really just, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, please, maybe you'll be the next person. <laughs> it's probably like, when are you gonna shut up? And I'll be like, <laughs> I'm sorry. Thank you. Following on from Claudia's question about cultural differences, yes. I see that Cheers is going to be set in Ireland. What? Yes. Wow. Which That's to great. me is truly fine. You can tell I'm obviously Irish. That's but yeah, yeah. The way we were brought up, we didn't contextualize humor. It was just the idea was everything that was absurd was absolutely priceless. And something that was the norm was considered, you know, normal. Funny by English people, but Irish people thought that was just normal. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I wonder what you think Ireland is going to make of a series like Cheers. It's an American company that's going to make it in Ireland. Really? Yeah. Uh, will I get any of that? Because <laughs> that will change how I think it's going to do. <laughs> I honestly don't know. The proof will be in the pudding. We'll, we will see. But I'll be very curious to know how it does. I'll ask around. I think I know some people. Oh, that's very interesting. Good luck with it. I hope you like it. Are you going to be there or are you just stuck here now? Be, okay. Well, great. Did you come all this way from Ireland? Okay. Um, <laughs> yes, sir. Hi. Um, how do you feel about laugh tracks being added into shows that aren't recorded in front of a live audience, like uh, Big Bang Theory, for example? Uh, I, it's my understanding of Big Bang Theory. There are clips on the internet of Big Bang Theory. Without the laugh track without on. Without the laugh track. However, the ones I've seen, it is not that it was shot without a laugh track. The laugh tracks are the studio audience laughing, studio audience laughing that have been wiped off the soundtrack because sometimes you will hear ambient noise suddenly shut off at the point where the laugh is supposed to be. So someone wiped off laughs from an actual audience that was there. Okay? Um, so um, what do I think of it? I think if it's done so that you can't even tell the difference, I think that's fine. I, I, think it, I understand the psychology behind it because people are cued by the sound of other people laughing. If it sounds absolutely fake, they'll be turned off by it. But if it sounds real, then sometimes that will actually spark more laughter. You know? But I, I think we, since we've talked about soundtracks, should we take one more question and then we'll call it a night? Sure, and I want to remind people that we're going to have um, a book signing in the Hammer Theater lobby right after this, so please join us there. They're all going to sign my book? <laughs> <laughs> incredible. It'll be sort of like a yearbook. Fantastic. <laughs> um, okay, last question. Hi, thank you. Um, uh -huh. there, do you think there's something in the structure of Seinfeld that accounts for its longevity? You know, I'm going to simply come down to it was funny and irreverent. I mean, and also, you know what? There were new things in there, and there were new kinds of voices, and 
And also, they didn't wrap up everything and tell lessons and that sort of thing. I'll give you one, one thing about Seinfeld, uh, that a little bit of interesting TV history to me. Um, and I know this because, you know, people say, how did Ch Seinfeld change sitcoms? And the easy answer is, well, it was the show about nothing. Okay, and it is absolutely easy and absolutely wrong. It started off as a show with little tiny stories, but after the after a while, they were very complicated stories. There were stories about Jerry trying to sell a story, the episodes to NBC about a show about nothing. But that in itself is a very complicated story. The stories got more and more complicated, as complicated as anything on TV. It was no longer a show about nothing. That was just the moniker it had. How did it really change TV? I'll tell you. Before Seinfeld, a multi-camera sitcom that is a sitcom shot in front of a studio audience had an average of six scenes total. Okay, many episodes only had an act one and then an, uh, a commercial and then an act two, maybe a tag. But the average was about six scenes, maybe as many as ten. And you, it was basically shot like a stage play. And you have a little bit of the B story come in and then leave and then other characters would come on and do the A story. And what happened with Seinfeld is you had four lead characters, none of whom actually lived in the same set or worked in the same set. And so to keep them all alive, you had to sort of follow them all on their different journeys. And the scenes got shorter and shorter and shorter. And I remember it had never done on a multicam because what, you're going to build more sets for a two-line scene. The idea of a two-line scene was like, we were all just running around with our heads on fire back then. Like, what? Uh, I remember sitting with other writers with a notepad and counting the number of scenes in a Seinfeld. 22, 23, they can't possibly, 24. You know, it was crazy. <laughs> yeah. This is only theoretical. And, um, <laughs> and yet they did it. And so then other shows started doing Friends was like a show like that, where it's like little tiny scenes occasionally that had two lines. And what that did is it made the shows a little more jagged, a little more less a little less laconic. That these are the long scenes like a play that you could pop over to here and then pop over to there, and you had to hold story ideas in your head that you didn't have to work as hard for before. It energized the medium. And so sitcoms after that, there was a, like you could actually have a broader spectrum. Frasier had the longer scenes, although occasionally I would throw in the shorter ones. Um, but that's how Seinfeld changed sitcoms. And so that, and that I think accounts for the longevity. There was something fresh about it, and, but not only fresh, it was funny, and it was irreverent, and they weren't just teaching lessons and wrapping things up at the end of a lot of episodes, which a lot of shows were still doing when Seinfeld started, and which I think I work on a show that does that now. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, but, uh, but I think that's, that's what Seinfeld gave to TV. That's my feeling. All right, I think that's it, and uh, I guess there's some book signing. And thanks for coming, really.